Hello everyone, my name is Mirna and on behalf of the Mindalia TV team, welcome to Mindalia live streaming where thousands of people around the world gather daily to see the lectures and interviews organized by Mindalia TV. Today with us we have Stan Sorensen, he is the founder of the Healing Exchange Center and he, along with me, is going to be having a great conversation with Don Jose Ruiz. He lectures and gives workshops around the world, he is an author and a speaker and he basically dedicates his life to sharing the ancient Toltec wisdom. Before starting with them, we want to remind you that Mindalia's mission is to share information that can help raise the level of consciousness around the world and you can help us by subscribing to our channel, leaving us a positive comment on this video or sharing it with someone that you know that is going to benefit of the content that we're going to be talking here today. Also, while we are live, while we are live streaming like right now, we are going to be having the active chat, the screen that you're going to be seeing here on my side or under the video in case that you're following us from a smartphone. So feel free to enter your questions there if you have any. Uh, we also want you to remind you that you can collaborate with Mindalia with your own valuable content and for that you can go to our website on the top you're gonna find the link that says collaborate with Mindalia. That link is gonna take you to a form that you can fill out and our technical team will be able to get in contact with you and you can collaborate with us in English through Mindalia TV English but you can also do it in Spanish through Mindalia Televisión and Portuguese through Mindalia Televisao. Visit our different channels and platforms. We want to see you there and also follow our Facebook pages and Instagram accounts. With that, you are not only helping us to reach as much people in the planet as possible, but you are also keeping yourself updated with the amazing information that we share there on a daily basis. We are not going to be delaying this any further, and I have now the great pleasure of saying welcome to Mindalia live streaming, Stan Sorensen and Don Jose Ruiz. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Myrna. Um, and, uh, and welcome, Don Jose. This has been uh, a plan of mine since last year. Uh, we, uh, we actually met in uh, Venice Beach last year. And I asked uh, Don Jose if he could come and talk to us on Mindalia. And he said, sure, just send me an email. <laughs> so I didn't know the email, so I <laughs> had a little time uh, getting around to making the connection. Uh, but I wanted I wanted to start uh, kind of like with a question that really intrigued me, and I'm going I'm going to give you a long introduction uh, because the first time I met. Uh, Don Jose in person was in Sedona, Arizona. It was about two years ago at a place called Gathering of the Shamans or the event. And anyway, I was there and I was looking at the menu and there's lots of choices of workshops to go to. I mean, even, even Mama Gaia was there. I, I had, you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful event. And I was looking at what to do. And I said, well, there's, there's Don Jose, there's, there's Don Miguel Jr. And uh, well, Don Miguel Jr., he's older. So I want to go to him, you know? So I made, on, I made a mark on my schedule. Go see Don, uh, Don Miguel Jr. Well, I m made a mistake and I marked Don Jose. And I said, oh, I made a mistake. I'm going to see the younger brother, uh, -huh. but you know what, when you walked in the room and you stood on that stage and you started telling your story, it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. I could not, I, I was just blown away by this passion and the, and the, the story that you told. It was just, it, you became my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Of all the brothers. And of course, we've met since then. We we spent some time in Teotihuacan, and we spent a, a whole hour in a van together going back to the airport. Uh, we, we just, but you're still my favorite. <laughs> I think it's because of that passion that you have, the, the place that you come from. And my question has to do, because I heard your story, and you weren't always a Don. You used to be kind of a renegade, right? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Well, my first question is, how did you manage to turn your life around and become a Don? Well, it was very simple. The act, it, be, it seemed very difficult, the attachment. But uh, the, the simplicity was that if it was doubt that got me into suffering, it will be doubt that gets me out of suffering. And what I mean, I've been being skeptical of my own negativity. Because, you know, when you want to change, you don't care to be right. You don't care to be proven right. You don't care for the ego to be validated. You just want freedom. You just want air. So I was in a stage of my life where I just wanted to be air. And that air for me is being a service. Because it comes a point in life when you just wake up and you have all this consciousness. And the only thing that will save you from yourself is when you have your devotion where you feel grateful. And one of the things I feel grateful for is my family tradition. So the moment that I re re decided to return back home and, and, and give my word to honor this tradition, you know, my life began changing because I'm in the lineage of serving again. And something about magical about serving, people don't understand that that's the real enlightenment. Enlightenment is not when the rainbow comes in and the band becomes into your presence and you know, everything is just beautiful. No, uh, service is enlightenment because we represent heaven and we take heaven wherever we go, especially in suffering and hell. And that's one of the places where I woke up. So in order to become a Don, I have to really overcome myself, overcome my lies, overcome my, my negativity. And, uh, and I know there was no conflict between uh, good and evil, it was between truth and lies. And all the lies that I believed in that caused me into suffering. So I begin being skeptical of my own negativity. I begin stopping, you know, giving my own poison and give myself the, the force and the passion to live life. And the force and passion is what make us, you know, when we're, when we're getting born from mothers to, to get to mother's egg after leaving a father's, uh, as, as uh, we're going to the ovulum and, you know, we're fighting for life. You know, we're wanting to reach that egg as a seed and we want to get to fight for life. So that doesn't stop. We, we, that, that force doesn't stop. The only thing that separates us is our mind and our wounds. So when I was living this kind of life, when I was in drug addiction, I said, I don't want to live this kind of life anymore. I've hurt my body so much. Now it's time to honor my body. And it's, you know, trying to be impeccable with my word. And this is the return home. Because when you begin being impeccable with your word, something magical happens that you begin thinking impeccably. And the only thing that, that matters now is just taking care of your garden. And that's my service that I do. Wow. Yeah. So uh, in, in terms of uh, suffering, you said suffering was... Uh, um, I read in part of your book that you, you talked about addiction to suffering. And I'm really working hard to get that clear in my mind. What is this addiction to suffering? Because I work with addiction uh, in my job and I help people with their addictions. But addiction to suffering is not something people easily, easily uh, comprehend. I don't comprehend it. Why would I be addicted to that? Why would I be compelled to suffer? Well, one of the things that we humans have, we, we just our justification and we have excuses and we defend those excuses and justifications. And we even come to the conclusion that, you know, that suffering is normal, but it's not normal. It just, we said it's normal because we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to overcome it. And that's why it becomes normal. But suffering is not normal because you have two types of suffering. The one that is like the wolf, that you feel pain, heartbreak, and you out the wolf, but you don't punish yourself with that story. And then there's the negative punishment, the negative suffering that we punish ourselves a thousand times for the same story again and again and again. And that's the addiction of suffering that we talk about. So in substance, before we, be, we begin hurting ourselves, hurting our body and going to this addicted substance world, we begin being addicted to suffering by feeling all this pain in life and not wanting to deal with it, but we begin to run away and numb it. So many addictions, they don't deal with the problems because they're still dealing with the addictions. They're dealing with the consequence of opening, crossing woods, but behind all that that got us into that kind of lifestyle, it was those sufferings that we believe in and it was all those lies. So I talk not as a, as a psychologist, I don't talk about experiencing for other people. I talk about my own experiences because I was one of the addicts and one of the teachers that I had was paranoia. And that paranoia led me to suffering, made me to, you know, to see the stories that were not real. And then later in life, when I begin overcoming my paranoia, overcoming my nervous system, I begin seeing that the stories that I built around my life, they were not real. 
there was just a tool to support the addiction of suffering, which was the death of my grandfather, which was the, the time that I got sexually abused and what the time that I tried to commit suicide and all those negative stories that I give story to and give power to. And when someone talked to me, I would only talk to them like a hunted ghost. What do I mean by that? All the justification and excuses that I had in my head, well, look what life took away, look what this did, look what this, that. You know, I wasn't trying to change. I was just severing my addiction of suffering. But the moment that I did try to change is because I was tired of living that way. I woke up in ghost town and I said, this is the thing I have to leave behind. And it's not because of the substance. It was what led me to go into that substance and what's the addiction of believing in all those lies, making myself a victim, making myself a martyr and thinking that it's okay, but it's not okay. And the moment that I said, I will not give that to the love of my life is when I really step into the Totec tradition. And in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn. It's only to unlearn. Unlearn what? Unlearn what takes our inspiration to live away because Totec means artists, artists of the spirit. So when the artist is aware that it's addicted to suffering, it's because the artist is not creating anymore and it's just creating pain everywhere it goes. So with awareness, we begin shifting our consciousness and being responsible for what comes out of us, what we do, what we say. And you, no, no more hiding behind our knowledge, no more hiding behind our words, because I see many people hiding behind their knowledge, hiding behind their books. But what is good reading all those books of transformation if you don't take the act of changing? And this is where the act of kindness comes in. And when you get the act of kindness coming out of your heart and you look into the mirror, you can totally be honest. Yes, I'm addicted to suffering and I want to change. But it's only that honesty will let you go. But, you know, we're humans. We're so intelligent. We're creating just to be an excuse to not change, to live in an island of safety. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are leaving us without words here. Please stand, continue. No, you had a question, Marina. I, I actually did. And I wanted, I wanted to find out about, you know, yes, I completely agree with you. We are addicted to suffering. And... Why do we fear so much changing and correcting? Why do we fear so much leaving behind that person, that part of us that is actually addicted to that suffering? Because it seems that we are more scared of finding that light, of finding that path, than what we are scared of keeping the, the life that we are keeping on a daily basis. Yes, because we prefer a pain that we're used to. We prefer to stay in a dream that we're used to. Like if we're in a busy relationship, we don't want to let that person go free because we're using that person to hurt ourselves and we're hurting ourselves with that person too. But it comes a point in our life where we see this just as another story. And fear is the biggest indicator of our courage. In life, we're going to fear so many things, but the important things about fear is overcoming it because it just identifies of what we need to do and change. You know, It's always going to be a little fear of, of excitement of anything because what people are afraid is of the unknown. That's why we prefer to stay in a pain that we're used to, in a pain of suffering, in an abusive relationship, because we're afraid to see what's in the other side of life. Like how many times were we in a relationship 20 years ago thinking that relationship is going to be forever, it's going to be, you know, the perfect relationship, but then something happens in life. And then we think we could never leave this person, but then 20 years later with, with another person. It's because, you know, we're naturally made to change. We're, we're naturally made to transform. It is our attachment that does not transform and our attachment to things for the person who put us in ego, thinking if we have that, we'll be happy. But sometimes we get those things and doesn't make us happy. So we justify to the world, we're not, we pretend to be happy, but we're not happy because when we are not afraid to change, when we're not afraid to feel that fear, it's easy to transform and let a dream go. But the moment that we give power to that transformation and change, we will never change because we're addicted to that, you know, to that way of suffering. And this is one of the beautiful things about becoming a dream master. A dream master is not the one that can control somebody else's dream. No, that's superstition. A dream master is the one that self it's, that self itself with love, that masters itself with love, that masters itself with so much love that he loves himself so much that he begins to be honest with yourself, saying, this life is not good for me anymore. This dream is just being me suffering. I'm afraid of the unknown, but I prefer to take that leap of faith, that act of transformation, instead of being here for another 50 years of suffering. I will get my, my strength out and mm -hmm. I will leave the island of safety. And, you know, this is one thing that makes us alive. Most of the things that make me alive is when I feel, I feel something. And uh, like being on stage when I was a kid, I remember being afraid to speak in public. But when my dad got me on the stage when I was 19 years old, I loved it. And I could feel the fear in my body. But then I noticed it was just excitement. So we, we humans are afraid of feeling our emotions. 
especially when we feel heartbreak and we feel excited and we feel fear and we feel jealous. You know, we don't want to look at that. But if we begin looking at that, our emotion from a personal point of view with no story, we can totally support mother. And divine mother is our body. Not so matter if you're male or female, you know, you're, you're coming to your body. So this is the point of the little angel that's holding the Virgin of Guadalupe. The Virgin of Guadalupe is the one who's going to feel the fear, who's going to feel the emotion. But the little angel holding her in a moon plate, that's the real us, our intent. And this is the one who walks through fire. That's why I love the, the metaphor of yoga, because yoga begins not with the movement of the body, because if you start with the movement of your body, you will think of all the problems and you're not going to be present with your body doing the movements. No, yoga begins to get comfortable in the discomfort, get comfortable in the uncomfortableness. And when you begin getting comfortable in the uncomfortableness in your mind, then you can get ready to do your movements. So just imagine getting comfortable in the uncomfortableness in this life and saying, okay, I'm afraid to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways because that's an indicator that my courage is going to get me to the other side. And when you do it, it will feel so alive because we're going to do it again and again and again because that's the whole point about being alive, to not paralyze ourselves with fear. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. The fear, I've, I've studied and, and learned and experienced a lot of it myself. And uh, one of the things that... Um, became clear to me was that fear is a message that is coming from somewhere in my system, in my mind, my mind, like the, the uh, amygdala part of my brain or something. And it says there's a danger and it's, and my brain wants to protect me from the danger. And so what it does, it jumps into my history, into my memories and it finds everything that looks like that, that's bad. And then I get this rush, of uh, image of horrible things that could happen. And I think the challenge for me as a person is to let that horrible, all that memory stuff flash through and stay with it, not run away or go addict to an addiction to, to get out of that uncomfortable, but to sit with that discomfort of, of those old memories flashing through. And then when they're through, I can see what's real, or at least closer to what's real. Yes, uh, absolutely. I agree with you 100% in that. It's like my father said, if you don't like a group of people, you can just walk away from them. But if you don't like yourself, every corner you take, you're going to be with you. So <laughs> th that's the moment to be honest, you know. Okay, what is this stopping me? And the moment that you're honest, like you're saying, you know, you begin having awareness of what's stopping you. Now is the action of unlearning. And this is one of the beautiful, masterful things about the Totic tradition to let go of things, to unlearn things, yes. to let go of the stories that we're creating. Because at one point, like you're saying, we wake up consciously that we're married to this life, to this body. This is the love of our life. So this love of our life is a human body that feels emotions. It tells us when it's fearful. It tells us when it's happy. It tells us when it's jealous. When it, you know, all these emotions. And mm -hmm. it's communicating through us. So I really feel like I'm talking to the divine, to God, whatever you want to name this force that give us life, to life itself. When I listen to my emotions, because it's not in English, it's not in Spanish. It's just to put attention. And just imagine, if we can put attention to our own body, and we're becoming into a path of healers, then we go into life, we can feel people's emotions. Beyond their story, we can feel where they're at. That's why when people scream at us and they're negative to us, you know, we cannot take them personal if we are aware, because they're just asking for help. And what's asking for help, that's something inside of them that's suffering. That's something of them that you know that is so loud that they scream for help and they don't even realize it. So if we take them personal, we're just helping them get even deeper in that suffering. But we want, the moment that we become aware and we deal with our own poison, we deal with our own negativity, there's a smoke that gets lifted through our presence. And that presence, it is, you know, the clean mirror. So wherever you go, you, you are a clean mirror because your heart is out there in the presence. And that's one of the beautiful things about the shaman the Nawaz, the Swamis, the divine lineage that is in service to life because they feel the mother within them and they get over themselves to not bring that old negative dream to the right now because let's say we all have the temptation when we're in a relationship to bring the past negative things of all relationships and we try to just, just justify and manipulate our ways to the new dream by imposing our will and that's not respect anymore. We're living out of fear, trying to make somebody the perfect image of what we think is perfect relationship, but it's not true. The perfect relationship is us being our authentic self and us enjoying somebody else in their own creative art, in those true authentic heart, because 
what happens in this addiction of suffering in this world is people pretend. People pretend what they're not. And people think they're going to be accepted when they're pretending. But you know what? It's painful to live this way because you're not living authentically. It's like wearing a mask and somebody says to you, when are you going to wear your real mask? And he goes, you know what? There is no mask to wear. It's just open heart. So at this point, I talk about the clean mirror because we're chafe shifting all the time. And it's so beautiful when we can leave our own belief system in the closet and just walk with a pure, chafe shiftless um, heart because people will tell us what they think, how they live. And here we learn something new because we're not imposing our belief system anymore. We're listening to a program. And when we listen to a program, we can reflect and especially see where people are stuck. And this is the power of storytelling. When you do a story, you're not telling the people straight to the point and putting the finger at them, whatever there is. No, you tell a story, it goes, the teachings go like a hundred teachings in once. Whatever people need, they're gonna get it like the tree of life. And this is one of the beautiful things about overcoming ourselves. You know, we give that opportunity to somebody else. So when you're telling a story, you're telling a story that people uh, can relate to in their own, the way they hear it. So you could tell the same story and a hundred people can hear a different story based on the way that they uh, have a past memories to interpret that story. And exactly. So you're not really responsible for uh, their outcome. They are. And mm -hmm. if I hear your story and it, I get excited, well, that's, that's maybe something I heard something really positive in your story and I can cherish that and, 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 and enjoy that. Uh, if your story tells me something and I get scared or angry, then uh, again, I have to look inside of myself to find where did that come from? Where, mm -hmm. What is the threat? What is the unfairness that I'm noticing? And each person will be different. So yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Because uh, it, it's absolutely because one thing that gets triggered is our ego, our personal yes. importance. Because, you know, if there was nothing ego, who cares? You know, it's just like adults, uh, like the elders, the grandparents who just see kids being kids. But uh, when the moment that the grandparent takes it personal, it's because there's something to deal with because the illusion is still got a hold on. Uh -huh. So when we begin listening to this, why am I taking this personal? It's because, you know, we begin seeing something that we put attention to. And this is the vortex that we live in the life. Where we would put our attention, that's what we're going to perceive. And we're constantly opening channels, vortexes without even awareness. You know, we make things sacred that, you know, we open this vortex in Sedona. We open this vortex in Santa Fe, in the desert. But you know what? The real vortex that we're being open is the way that we open the vibration in our life. Like, say... A person is going to open a vortex of gossiping and it's going to gossip about somebody. So they open a vortex of negativity, of putting people down and it's going to create irritation. It's going to create all this negativity that's not going to feel good. And that's a vortex. People don't mm -hmm. understand this. The word creates a vortex. The word creates story. The word lifts up spirit and the word breaks spirit. So how we use the word in a foundation of a story it's going to trigger, like my father made the four agreements. He put integrity into those four agreements. It was a story that he made for himself. But anyone who reads those stories that I talk to, they think, oh, he made this story just for me. He made this agreement just for me because I was one of them too. And, uh, and when I said, you know, I know these stories, dad. He goes, of course, you know, it's integrity talking to integrity. And you can lie to your integrity. But then when I begin practicing the four agreements, I see how I corrupted my own world. Why? because I went to, to him and said, you know, Father, these agreements, they're so difficult. He goes, no, these agreements are simple. The difficult agreements is the agreements that you have made with yourself in this life. Exactly. So, so when we begin seeing our story against ourselves, we create a story that hurts ourselves. It's because we're not honest. We're trying to pretend we're trying to wear a mask. But the moment that we give up, we surrender to life. It's because we're tired of dealing with negativity, with jealousy, with envy and hatred. And people who talk to us about that, like, honestly, I, I really don't have time for that in my life anymore. I will deal with that if somebody that I love is, 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 you know, in trouble. I will deal with that. But personally, I cannot surround myself in that life anymore because I know that also vibration is like vampires. There will be people into your life that, you know, that you're trying to help it. After 50 times of trying to help them, they just will suck your energy. And then when they suck your energy, you, you're going to take that energy to your home. And you really have to take care of your vibration. You really have to take care of your temple. Just because, you know, we say no to a person doesn't mean that we're bad people. No, it's that we honor our temple. 
and our spiritual being even gross because we don't let nobody else's negativity hurt us like we hurt our own negativity because this is what happens. We hurt ourselves with other people. And the moment that we respect ourselves, that completely changes. Don Jose, I wanted to, to ask you something. You talk about masks, the masks that we wear and that mask is the one that is basically creating all the drama. And uh, I kind of understand that the drama that we create and the story, the personality, it's basically to belong, to belong to the pack and belonging to the pack at a certain point, it meant our own survival within you know, the, the social structure. You decide you we're gonna be taking that mask off, no mask, I'm gonna be myself, I'm gonna start living more in, you know, in integrity and aligned with the higher vibration. How has that affected that pack sense? Like, are you able, and you kind of just gave me the answer right now, but are you still able to surround yourself with the same kind of people or you, know, you had to create just a new environment, a new social group? Because I understand that not everybody wants to hear this. People are like, oh, no, that, yeah, he, that sounds beautiful, but I'm not gonna practice that. So how has that impacted your life, if I may well, ask? Well, people have, people have come and go from my life because people cannot deal a lot with integrity. Because when they deal with that with integrity, they try to break your spirit, break you down. And before I let them break me down, but, but now I don't because I respect myself so much. And, you know, there's a beautiful quote that I like in the Internet of two people walking away from each other. Mm -hmm. And the quote says, just because they're walking away from each other, doesn't mean they don't love each other anymore. It just means that they're part of their story is over. So I can no longer hang around people who were when I was a junkie because it's not me anymore. I can no longer hang with my ex-wife because it's not me anymore. I can no longer hang up with people, you know, that were, you know, a negative part in my life because I honor myself anymore. And the moment that you begin honoring yourself, people will just walk away and people will come into your life because at one point you're the love of your life. No one has the right to scream at you and you don't have the right to scream at anybody. So you begin having your space around it. So now in my life, people think about coming and talking to me. Why? Because I will reflect exactly what they don't want to hear or what they will hear. And sometimes... They will, they won't really know. Like, I remember somebody talking about uh, my father, you know, and uh, they're talking about their tradition, their belief system. And then this sub person asked, What does Don Miguel think about that? And he goes, Oh, I will never take that to Don Miguel. He goes, Why not? Because he will burst my bubble. Because people already know that in some places they will not be allowed to do that. It, like, if a kid makes a tantrum and it goes with a grandparent that there's no tantrums allowed, that kid will not do a tantrum what they do in their home because people permit what they do in their house. So in my house begins being disrespected. I will allow it to be disrespected every time somebody comes. But the moment that I do one act that you will not disrespect my home, that's it. And that's something that I would also do as the love of my life. No partner has the right to disrespect me. I don't have the right to disrespect no partner because I'm responsible for my half of my relationship. And when I live this way, I wake up to be at service to this because this is divine mother. No one's gonna hurt my mother. No one's gonna hurt, you know, my goddess. And as a matter, if I'm male, this body is part of the earth. And my mind, my mind is here to protect this part of the earth from myself beginning and from other parasites. So this is the beautiful thing about learning in life of the addiction of suffering and the underworld. We come back to just adore life once again. And that's the gift that was given to us that people forget about with their daily problems, with their sacrifice, especially in this time of generation when we see modern television and, you know, you see all this drama and gossip. And, you know, everybody's looking for the heartbreak. Everybody's looking for the internal suffering. Everybody wants to stay asleep. But when you wake up, I'm not sorry to say this, you can no longer go back to sleep because you're consciously woken up to serve. And your love is the love of yourself, your marriage, the love of your life. Wow, you know, you, you, you speak very quickly and you say a lot. And I, I get so stimulated hearing, hearing uh, you talk. So I have lots of questions and I know we don't have all day, but uh, hopefully uh, on uh, Sunday coming up soon, you're going to be in the Antelope Valley and uh, doing a workshop. And I, I'm telling everybody, you know, Don Jose is coming to Antelope Valley. Uh, you know, we want to show this video real quickly, you know, to sign, kind of help people um, be encouraged to come to your event. So. Can you tell us just a little bit about what you what you plan or what you expect? I know you like you like to play it by ear, 
But, yes. Uh, <laughs> can you give us a little idea of what to expect on Sunday? Uh, yes. Well, when I was a kid, I remember I was 13 years old and I was writing a, a note and my father said, what are you writing? I said, I'm preparing a speech in case you put me to talk. And he grabbed that paper, he broke it. And he goes, no, you always speak from your heart. Okay. And ever since then, you know, I will speak from my heart. So in this uh, Sunday and on the day of the sun, uh, I will be in Antelope Valley, and I'm so happy to present the wisdom of the shamans, a story that I've been uh, sharing from the last book, letting everybody know that everyone's a shaman and everybody keep up the flame. And one of my purpose is to ignite the flame with passion, because as you hear me speak, it's just like a waterfall that is coming through me and I just let the water just pour. And uh, this is one thing that I would do, sharing stories of transformations, sharing stories of my upbringing with my father. But especially being grateful to the Totec tradition, because in the Totec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn. And I want to wake up everybody with their passion, because once you feel your own passion, you feel the love for life. And this is something that is beyond words. It's, it's a body to body. It, it is a passion to passion, because we all are artists. And the question it is, uh, what kind of art are we creating? What is the art we share with the people we say we love with all our heart and to ourselves? If we like the art, we can continue, but if we don't like it, I invite you to change that art and to share the art from the real self that you are, your heart. Because when you create art from the heart, you know, create so many beautiful stories of transformation, so many beautiful stories of inspiration. And that's what I'm going to be sharing this Sunday. My open heart, and I'm just going to go there for all because this is my first speech in a few years, in a few months after Teotihuacan that I just came back. I came back for four weeks and I got this download from the Divine Mother and uh, I can't wait to share this with everybody. And it's the first time I will be sharing it on stage. So I'll oh, be that, happy to do this. <laughs> that's really exciting. You know, uh, some, sometimes people talk about your father's book, The Four Agreements, and they said, I read that book. And, you know, and then I picked it up and I read it again a year later, and it was a, like a different book. Because yeah. uh, we're always getting a download. We're always getting new uh, perspectives. And so after your uh, your return from Teotihuacan, uh, you will be full of uh, kind of like different stories. So you'll be a brand new book to listen to. That's wonderful. I'm so excited. Yes. I've, yes. I've, my wife, Yumi, was going yes, to be absolutely. with me. Yes, we, we, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we're all yes, we, we, we've been, uh, yeah, we, We've been working a lot on the new book, The Medicine Back. We almost have it finished. So there's a lot of yeah. great stories that I, I would share from that book as well. The medicine bag, that's an intriguing title. Uh, when, when you mentioned the medicine bag, it reminded me of uh, somebody said, I keep my medicine bag on my heart. Yes. And, 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 uh, and, and what Myrna said a little while ago, I don't know if we were on the interview yet or not, but she said, uh, the medicine bag is in our heart. You know, it is our yes. heart. Yeah, and we have to yeah. get into that place. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, when, when, we, when we have our heart open, that's the medicine back because we only put sacred things there. Yeah. Like this necklace is very dear for me. It's been from my grandmother and my, and my father's and passed to me every time I wear it is, is from when I do ceremony. But I carry this in my heart because I, I have so much passion and respect for this that it's the heart that purifies the intent. And mm -hmm. if we get things, objects, and it doesn't come from the heart and we keep it in our sacred healing bag, you know, we're just hurting ourselves with it, you know, a, a act of jealousy, a, a wedding ring that the relationship didn't work, you know, and we hurt ourselves with a heart, but the moment that we let that go and we put objects that we give heart to, that we give love to it, that we hold dear in our heart, that's what we feel because that creates the most beautiful memories to keep going. Yeah. Well, this has been a very, very interesting uh, talk. Like I said, you, you, you've already stimulated my thinking in many ways. I wish I could just keep asking questions, but I forgot the questions already. <laughs> <laughs> I only have like 99 and probably 99 point A and B. <laughs> okay, well, what's, the, what, what's, the, what's, the, what's the 75th question of yours, Marina? One of the questions uh, that I had is about the dream mastering. You actually mm -hmm. give seminaries and workshops about that, right? Yes. Can we say that basically we, this is like lucid dreaming? We're lucid well, dreaming. We have the superpower of knowing that we can't be harmed and you yeah, can just. 
Yes, and, and one of the beautiful things about uh, the art of dreaming is that we're dreaming with a sleeping mind and sleeping with a wake mind. That even when we're sleeping, we still have the point of intent. And when we wake up the point of intent in our sleeping dream, there's no time. But when we wake up in this time, there is time. And our intent becomes even more, more powerful because we can say we're living a life. And we don't like our life, we can change it. Why? It's because life is a dream. And we don't like our dream, we can change it. And this is what many people don't understand. They think that you become slave to dreams, slave to emotions, slave to habits. But it's just a way of dreaming. So when you wake up with the art of dreaming, that you know that you are sleeping and dreaming all the time, you can change it whenever you want, because that's the art of letting go. And there is a recurrent question that I always ask myself, and as many people as I can. We learn, right, our mind. We learn and learn and learn and learn, and we study this, we study that. But it's so hard to actually start living it, practicing. What yes. would you recommend to our audience to start actually feeling, to start using the heart and letting ourselves just, you know, I, I like calling it like losing the handbrake. Well, action. Action. It's simple, it's simple as action, doing our best. Because if there's no action, there's no consequence. The moment that you have action with the intent for bettering your life, that, that purpose, that intent behind your action is like the intent that I'm talking about that manifests dreams. So just imagine your intent, prophetizing what you're going to do in one year. Like, I'm going to quit cigarettes. I'm going to quit alcohol. I'm going to quit eating meat. I'm going to quit hurting my body. In one year, I give myself. That intent requires action. If you don't take the action, nothing's going to happen. But if you take action, you're going to manifest a dream. And not only that, you're going to test the power of your word, the power of your manifestation. And then you become a dream master, bringing things from the unmanifest. How about feeling? Because I, mm -hmm. I understand and I feel that we, we have been taught to suppress feelings. Whenever we're, we're children, oh, yeah. you want to cry and they say, oh, don't cry. Or you're feeling sad and they say, oh, don't feel sad. Have, you know, think happy thoughts. And we have the costume, at least me, and I'm trying to get rid of that, of always having my mind get distracted so I don't get to feel. What I have come to realize Uh, uh, luckily at this age and not later in life <laughs> is that suppressing it's it's only holding the feelings down and they are like you know in, they are th th that's a cancer that's actually a cancer that is there like a tumor but i don't have education like like emotional education to let those feelings just you know happen through me and get rid of that. So I'll be basically, I have like a well, 40 the, the year- The powerful thing is that you are already aware of that. That's the most powerful thing. Now it's just the action to not create any justification or excuse why not to take the action. You see all the excuses and justification that we get to our head, why we cannot do it. And this is the fifth agreement to be skeptical of our own mm -hmm. negativity. But the moment, yes, and, and the moment that we begin being a doubt of the negativity, we change it too, because we don't believe in those tasks, but we believe in ourselves. And that's the moment that everything begins changing because we know what's already good for us and we already see the land. We just have to, you know, pedal that, that boat to get to the land. Okay. Dear Stan, do you have a final closing question? Yes. I want to say to everybody, never disrespect your art. You are an artist of love and you come here to learn. And we're perfect with the mistakes that we have done, that are doing and that we'll do because that's how we learn to taste life. And one of the beautiful things is stop judging ourselves. Stop the guilt and shame and break that spell in our life. Because the moment that we break that spell, we can come to life with pure awareness and not repeat things that hurt our life in the past, but learn from them. And, you know, they did happen because they happen. And this is how we learn. But thank you for this. We get the consciousness of what we don't want in our life anymore and what we do want. So what you want is the artist coming from your heart. Don't let yourself get in the way of it. Manifest that beautiful vibration into a manifestation and live your dreams because this is what you're here for in life to create the most beautiful piece of art and live it and just know that the life is canvas and how we paint the colors of life is how we take ourselves personal what excuses that we make how we react how we speak in our words that's how we create our art because then we have memories so i ask you to make the most beautiful masterpiece of art with your life and remember You can do whatever you want to do because this is your dream. This is your life. Don't believe in the old people that saying that you cannot do 
and especially yourself, overcome that negativity and break the curse of the scorpion that sting with its own stinger and be the artist that you were meant to be, the Toltec of love. Thank okay. you. <laughs> well, this has been a wonderful conversation and I know the, the, it will go out and help others raise their awareness. Uh, and that's the key. We need to raise our awareness, I think, if we're going to make a beautiful art in this world right now. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, that's just always a pleasure, uh, Don Jose. And uh, I'm looking forward to Sunday. I'm hoping that we will have uh, many more opportunities together uh, in the future as well, creating art. <laughs> Yes, and thank you for the invitation, and, and I look forward to coming back because there's still more to talk about. Oh, yes, there's so much to talk about. I mean, Myrna has 99.9 .9 questions, and I've got at least oh, that good. Many. <laughs> we can get the MV. <laughs> so we get 99 times more. What, one, one, for, one show for each question. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for your message of love. Thank you so much. Yes. Very nice, Dan. We'll let, we'll let uh, Myrna wrap it up here. Absolutely. Stan, where can our audience find you? Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm at uh, www.healingexchangecenter.com. And my phone number, which is the best way to get me, is 661-733-8444. Okay. Or just walk around the Antelope Valley and you'll, they'll oh, yeah, find Oh, yeah, everybody knows me in the Antelope Valley. <laughs> That's what everybody says. <laughs> and how about you, Don Jose? How can our audience find you? Well, you can find uh, on me under miguelriz.com. That's where we have our events, the family. And I like to put on Facebook, my personal page, and Instagram. I like to put arts, poems, uh, my thoughts, videos. So I share myself there, not in the fan page, but in the personal page. Okay. And what's your Instagram? Uh, Don Jose Riz, too. Don Jose Riz. Okay, we are yes. definitely going to follow you. To our audience, thank you for being with us today. And to you, Don Jose and Stan, thank you for allowing my Dahlia being a channel for your wisdom. And thank you for sharing your time with us. To our, thanks. To our audience, remember that you can collaborate with Mindalia with your own valuable content. You can do it in Spanish through Mindalia Televisión, Portuguese through Mindalia Televisao, and English through Mindalia TV English. Don't leave without leaving us a thumbs up, without liking the video or sharing it with someone that you know that can benefit of the content that we've been talking here today. Also, subscribe to this channel, but also to the Spanish channel and the Portuguese channel. With that, uh, you are not only helping us reach as much people in the planet as possible, but you also keep yourself updated with the amazing information that we share there on a daily basis we want to thank you again and from our heart to yours we're sending you a big hug big big hug and until next time